Welcome to the SEI podcast series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense and operated by Carnegie Mellon University. A transcript of today's podcast is posted at the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. My name is Nancy Mead. I'm an SEI fellow and principal researcher in the CERT division of the Software Engineering Institute. I'm here to introduce you to Carol Woody, who is the technical manager of our cybersecurity engineering team, also in the CERT division, and she is also a principal researcher just like me. We're here to talk to you about a book that we co-authored and which has just been published by Pearson Publishing. The book is Cybersecurity Engineering, A Practical Approach for Systems and Software Assurance. So let's talk just a bit about how we got to the point where we thought we could actually write a book on this subject. Uh, way back when I started my career at IBM Federal Systems, where I was involved in software development and software management of large systems. I became a senior technical staff member at, at IBM and later joined the SEI, where I was director of education, uh, and then migrated into CERT because I realized that all of the work we had done in software engineering had not been replicated on the security side. So there was no real attention to what happened in the software development life cycle when you were considering security. My research work has primarily been in security requirements engineering, and I have also led a software assurance curriculum design effort. Again, way back when, uh, I got a PhD in mathematics from Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute. So Carol, how about you? Well, my background is in systems and software engineering, and I've worked in a variety of industries, uh, banking, government, um, let's see, I worked for the administration at Yale University, which is a pretty good sized uh, structure, and uh, I handle all their financials. So financial management has been my specialty. Uh, my background includes an MBA in finance. Uh, undergraduate was mathematics, and then I did my PhD in information systems, um, actually focusing on risk management and a lot of the areas uh, related to the security problem space. Um, but I didn't really get involved in the security angles and, uh, until I was hired here at CERT to augment the efforts to drive what we had learned from the operational security side into how do we build these things so they can be secured. Because uh, right now, that's a real tough challenge. Absolutely. And one of the big challenges that we face is explaining to our constituency why this is so important. And uh, that gets us to the question of why we thought this was a good time to actually write a book on the subject. Exactly. Um, I'm continually told that we just have to get the systems built. Uh, we need all that functionality. It, it's, uh, it has to be cheap and it has to be fast. It's got to replace people and it's got to get things done quickly. And we don't have time for the security stuff because that takes extra effort and um, costs extra. And besides, we don't have the people that understand how to do that. Um, so hopefully our book will begin to support some of the issues of educating the world as to why it's important as well as um, how they can go about beginning to address it. Um, that's why we were focusing on the practical aspects. Um, I know that there were s um, there was a variety of people we considered the book for, so maybe we should describe who, who the audience would best be to um, read this one. That's an excellent point. Uh, one of the audiences that we seldom reach with our writing is the acquisition management audience. And they are so concerned with not only developing products but acquiring them, whether it be by contracts or by uh, purchase of commercial software, for example, that we felt it was really time to try to enhance their education so they would be thinking about cybersecurity 
and not solely about functionality. So that's one audience segment. Uh, another audience segment is actually the development managers and the mm -hmm. uh, technical staff that have the responsibility for building cybersecurity into their systems. Well, they're the decision makers, and if they don't provide the money and the support to make it happen and hire the right people to do it, it's going to be a challenge. It's interesting in that when I first started working in CERT and I told people I was working on cybersecurity, nobody knew what I was talking about. Uh, but now, when it's in the newspapers all the time, everybody knows what it's about, although they don't understand necessarily the connection with why it's so important when you're both developing and acquiring systems. Uh, in our blog post, we talked about seven principles that we developed in support of uh, cybersecurity engineering, but there's a whole lot more to the book than that. The seven principles were kind of an organizing framework. Um, what do you think about the other topic areas that we had in the book? Well, let me give a little bit of, of uh, exposure to the principles themselves. Sure. Uh, those grew out of um, a discussion I had actually with an international audience, uh, trying to explain to them why we were focusing on cybersecurity. And um, all of the written material that they had read focused on all of these security activities, hundreds of them that they needed to do. And the discussion really centered around, well, why do we need these things? And so the principles grew out of that because um, the just saying, well, you need to be secure wasn't enough. So how does that link with what we need to do? You've got risk issues. You've got trust. You're leveraging um, a, a lot of technology that, in some cases, you don't even understand. So how are you dealing with, with those uh, challenges? Um, and your point about the rest of the book, I think, is critical because we've made risk management the driving focus. Um, and in, in essence, that's because nobody goes out and just buys security for the sake of security. There's got to be a reason that they need that type of uh, control or structure around the data and, and, and what happens with their technology. But just slapping on a pile of controls doesn't necessarily get us there. What are you doing with the technology? Where, where is your data going to live? How broadly are you distributing information? What kind of people are going to be working with it? All of these become part of the decision making. And by the way, where are you getting this technology? Are you buying it off the shelf so that you're just taking what somebody gives you and hoping it works? Uh, is it something you're building? And then are more likely, we've got these Rube Goldberg constructions that are tying bits and pieces together with what's already there. So you've got the legacy interfacing with uh, new products that you're gluing, gluing together and then streamlining it out in some sort of distribution mechanism that may be somebody's smartphone that you don't even control, um, or it may be posted on the web and you don't necessarily control all of the uh, interfaces and, and access there as well. You brought up a couple of really important points. Uh, one is that we want to try to overcome the checklist mentality where somebody gives you a list of controls and you pick some that you think, oh, might be okay for your system and then again might not. And uh, also the supply chain issue. Where mm -hmm. does the software come from? How many people have touched it in how many different countries and uh, what mechanisms were in place to make sure that it, it was done with security in mind. Right. Often people don't really have a, a clue as to what that supply chain looked like and that's an area where we really want to have some impact. Well, we're also looking at as people are building software, it's a major planned process. But where in this process do they plan for the security they expect to be there at the end? If it's not integrated across the life cycle, there's no reason to assume it's there once you feel the system. And yet, in reality, 
um, our infrastructure and all of our critical uh, support systems, um, as well as all of our day-to-day -day operations, whether you're a biz small business or a, a, a large corporation or the government, is living and dying based on the technology. Uh, you get an outage because somebody else happened to have created a denial of service and suddenly you can't operate. Um, and so you have to think about those things when you're building the pieces to field in the first place. Otherwise, um, you're going to get it by accident, and that doesn't usually get you what you need. Well, the other thing that happens, of course, is that if you haven't considered security initially, there's a possibility that you won't be able to incorporate it later on because you've made decisions that preclude you doing a good job with security. We've heard of cases where whole systems were scrapped because they couldn't be right. made secure. So that's something we want to help people to try to avoid. Or your sustainment costs are huge because you're forever in this patching cycle. Uh, and we all really get tired of the patching cycle. And that seems to be a way of life these right. days. Along with the side effects because maybe the patch causes some other Break something to, else to emerge and people are afraid to apply the patches and leave themselves vulnerable as a consequence. Um, one area that I think was good to focus on was how to help our staff improve their capabilities um, by testing their competencies in cybersecurity and uh, we also looked at how organizations uh, can assess their competency to build cybersecurity and so I think those were nice uh, additions to the book as well. Mm -hmm. What we're hoping is that it will provide a sequence of how to tackle these things, more of a, a starting roadmap because otherwise you, you see these organizations just freeze because there's so much to do, they don't know what to do, and they end up doing nothing uh, because they don't feel like there's any way that the small amount that they can devote to it will make any sense to bother. Um, and if there are small incremental steps that you can start, each improvement is valuable. Um, it makes each iteration a little bit stronger and a lot more um, manageable as we move down the road. We've got to start tackling the volume of security problems. Uh, and maybe it's only baby steps to begin with, but if you don't take those, you're never going to get there. And that's one of the things that we did uh, as a summary of our book is, is to talk about how people could start to implement mm -hmm. some of these practices and perhaps what order they could do it in so that it would be most effective and, and not too painful for them to get into. Well, it's going to be painful no matter what. Um, all the pushback I get every time I'm, I'm working with organizations is, oh, there's so much to do. Can I just do a small piece? Yes, you can as a starting point, but then you have to grow and build. It's a uh, journey. Uh, it's not a uh, one-stop shop. I think the other uh, aspect of the book that I enjoyed from a writing perspective uh, was talking about some of our more recent research and mm -hmm. uh, giving people ideas of what they might consider in, in the future once they've gotten themselves to uh, a certain comfort level. Well, also what this book provided us with a, is a way of combining thing information that had been scattered in many different areas. Because you and I have both been writing in this right. area and producing papers and blogs and uh, a lot of, of content presentations for conferences, uh, et cetera, for many, many years. And this allowed us to kind of sift through that, coalesce it, and put it together, um, and certainly supports the curriculum effort, because one of the uh, uh, comments we kept getting when we were trying to push out the software assurance curriculum was, well, there's no textbook. So right. this now provides a textbook, so at least that gives us a base to build from there. And, and that's a, a good point to link back to the audience perspective. So we're not just aiming at practitioners, but also educators who mm -hmm. might be looking for a textbook to use in the classroom when they're doing software assurance or cybersecurity courses. Certainly. So I think that's a great addition. And you mentioned that we've given a lot of talks at conferences. Well, many times at conferences, we're preaching to the choir. True. Uh, we're talking to other researchers um, and people who are w already working in, in the field and um, 
they don't necessarily need the leg up that we're trying to provide them uh, with the book. So I think it, it hopefully will be a great addition to people, uh, not just on their bookshelves, but also uh, in practice. Um, is there anything important that we've left out? Not that comes to mind immediately. Um, certainly, we hope that a lot of people will benefit from at least reading parts of the book, even if not uh, all. It may not be one of those you want to pick up and read front to back. There's a lot in it. Um, but uh, certainly, it covers a lot of territory. And uh, our reviewers were especially positive in terms of uh, it, its uh, aim and audience and content. And we had a nice group of reviewers, um, both from U.S. and internationally, yes, and uh, from industry as well as DOD, so that was terrific. Um, one thing that I think is noteworthy for our viewers and purchasers of, of the book is that by purchasing and registering the book right. with Pearson, they get access to our executive overview video course, which is a really huge bonus for them. That's available on our uh, our online training program, and I think people would really enjoy taking a look at those videos. Some of which include you. Yes, I know. <laughs> they might get tired of listening to me, though. Oh no, never. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Our book, Cybersecurity Engineering, which we've already mentioned, has been published by Pearson. Uh, as of November 2016, you can find it on the Inform IT website, and you can also find it uh, on Amazon if you're so inclined. It's part of the SEI series in software engineering. We're going to be including links to the book on Inform IT as well as Amazon, along with other resources that we reference during this podcast. The podcast is available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and also on Carnegie Mellon University's iTunes U site. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.